Dr. Doug Lucas here, retired orthopedic surgeon and founder of Optimal Bone Health MD. If you've been diagnosed with osteoporosis or even osteopenia, your doctor may have talked to you about taking a drug in the drug class of the bisphosphonates. So these are drugs like Fosamax, Boniva, Reclast, and these drugs have a place. Now I find that these drugs are often, I think, overprescribed, but I also find that there's a lot of fear around these drugs. And there is a time and a place for each of these different types of drugs. So today I wanna to talk about this specific class of drugs. I'm gonna go through a little bit of the research behind what makes these drugs effective as tools. And then I'm gonna talk about some of the fears, some of the risks, the reason why people don't want to take them. And a lot of that's very justifiable. And then I'm gonna go through a couple of cases to help point out a couple of different scenarios. One where a drug would be recommended and I don't think it's necessarily the right thing to do. And then the other one where a drug is recommended and the patient's refusing, but maybe they should reconsider. So stick around if this is pertinent to you, your journey, or anybody that you know who is going through this. We're gonna get into bisphosphonates. So I wanna be very clear that I am not anti-drug. We do use drugs in our practice, but very rarely. When we go through our framework, we find that by the time we get to the end of the framework where we would consider drugs, drugs just aren't needed anymore. But there are scenarios where they're needed. We do prescribe them on occasion. I'm just not really a big fan of bisphosphonates, and I'll talk to you about why. So bisphosphonates are a specific class of drugs. Again, they fit into this group of drugs called uh, anti-resorptives, meaning that they slow down bone resorption. And these drugs go by names of Fosamax, um, Actinel, Boniva, Reclass. The generic names would be Alendronate, Risidronate, Ibendronate, Zoledronic Acid. They come in both oral and IV forms. So the way that these drugs work is that they bind to a part of the bone called the hydroxyapatite. Now this is in the matrix of the bone. These are the proteins of the bone. And when your bone is naturally turning over, the osteoclasts will go along and they'll tromp up the bone. And then the osteoblasts will come in and they'll lay down new bone. When the osteoclasts go along and, and chomp up the bone in somebody who's been given a bisphosphonate, it absorbs that bisphosphonate drug, which is bound to the hydroxyapatite. And then it essentially poisons the osteoclast. So your osteoclast function will plummet. This is good if you are rapidly losing bone and the osteoclasts are functioning more quickly than they're supposed to or that we want them to necessarily, um, or if there's an imbalance where osteoclasts are doing a whole lot more than osteoblasts and we're, we want to bring out the osteoblasts. If you look at the literature, it is pretty clear that it will, a bisphosphonate will increase bone mineral density by between five and 10%. So that is good, right? Um, they also will make the drug companies, that is, big claims as to the reduction in fracture risk. I want to dig into that reduction in fracture risk because I think it's really important that people understand some of the numbers around this. And this gets a little bit into the weeds of uh, statistics. So just bear with me while I explain this, and then we'll get into some of the more fun stuff in just a second. Okay, so let's talk about fracture risk for a second. So when we talk about a drug having an impact on fracture risk. This is ultimately what we want to know, right? Bone mineral density changes are, are good. We wanna see that. But ultimately, I wanna know, is this gonna prevent a fracture? There are two main ways that you can talk about fracture risk reduction. One is called relative risk, and the other one is called absolute risk. It's really important that we understand the difference because in the study that I'm about to talk about on zoledronic acid or reclast, you can see a big difference between the relative risk reduction of 70% versus an absolute risk reduction of around 1%. So how can the same drug have a wildly different array of numbers of 70% versus 1% of what seems like the same thing? Well, it all comes down to what type of fracture and the statistics around how you're representing those data. Okay, so first let's talk about the different types of fractures in these studies. So in the studies on drugs and 
usually most interventions, but specifically on drugs, you're going to find really three main types of fractures that they're talking about. They're going to talk about hip fracture, which is very clear, right? This is something that is clinically relevant. You know that it's happened um, and you can see it on x-ray. So there's not a lot of ambiguity on whether or not somebody has had a hip fracture. And then there are clinically relevant fractures, and that's kind of a vague group that I'm not going to talk about. And then there are what's called morphometric vertebral fractures. So what the heck does that mean? Well, morphometric just means that the shape, the morphology, the shape of that kind of boxy uh, vertebral body has changed. So when you look at an x-ray or potentially a CT, but this is usually done on x-ray, you can see um, the vertebral bodies will change shape from one x-ray to another. Now, what's interesting is that that's not always clinically relevant, meaning that people don't always know that that has happened. And I think there's is a lot of ambiguity here because in orthopedic residency training, so you're training to be an orthopedic surgeon, you look at, I don't know how many, but the hundreds of thousands of x-rays. Um, and one of the things we're taught is if you look at an x-ray long enough, you'll see a fracture because there's all kinds of little lines. We're looking at all these little things and we're trying to find what's causing this, this patient's symptoms. So I know that if you are doing a study and you're looking for morphometric changes to the vertebral body, there's got to be some discrepancy, some uh, observer challenges, meaning that one person will look at it and find one thing and another person will look at it and find another. So I know that that's in there. And if you look at morphometric fractures, they're always higher than clinically relevant fractures. So if you were to design a study and you wanted to see the biggest difference, then you would talk about morphometric fractures. So then let's get into the, the fracture risk. So when we look at this study on reclast, we can see that um, they talk about a 70% reduction in fracture risk. They're talking about that morphometric vertebral fracture risk. So in the intervention group, the people that took the drug, they had a 70% reduction compared to the people that took the placebo in fractures. So now let's talk about relative risk versus absolute risk. So I'm going to actually break this down into um, kind of a, a sample study. So this is not a real study, but this gets the point across, which is, let's say that there were 100 people in the intervention group. So 100 people are taking the drug. And then there are 100 people who are taking a placebo. So let's say that in the intervention group, one person suffered a fracture. One. And in the placebo group, there were two people that suffered a fracture. So now when we run the statistics and we talk about a relative risk reduction, there is a difference of two fractures versus one fracture. And if you went from two to one, that's a 50% reduction in fracture risk. Does that make sense? So 50% reduction in fracture risk, that's the relative risk. But if we look at the numbers another way, and let's call it absolute risk. So the absolute risk of fracturing from one group to another, if you had one out of 100 in the intervention group and two out of 100 in the placebo group, so now we had what would be a two out of 100 or a 2% fracture risk, right? Um, and then a one out of 100 or 1% 1 fracture risk. So the difference between two and one is one. So now we have an absolute risk difference of 1%. So I know that's challenging and I apologize for having to bring that up, but that's important because when you say you had a 50% reduction in fracture risk, that doesn't necessarily mean it's that clinically relevant, even though it's a very big number versus a 1% reduction in fracture risk. How many people do you need to treat to actually see that 1% reduction in fracture. And when we're talking about something like a non-clinically relevant fracture, how important is that actually? So let's go back to the reclass study. So the reclass study would then show that they had a 70% reduction in fracture risk. The absolute reduction in that study was actually 7%. So it goes from 70% to 7%. Now, to be fair, 7% is still clinically relevant. And um, it's a pretty significant number, actually, because it you do not have to treat that many people to get that reduction in fracture risk. However, when you go to the clinically relevant fractures and even take it one more step to hip fractures, which are both more significant and clinically relevant uh, and identifiable, the relative risk reduction there was 41%, not 70%. And the absolute risk reduction was actually 1.1% when you look at the, the, those data inside that study. So 
which is the right number to represent to people? Well, I think it's ultimately all of it. Uh, now, this is challenging because doctors don't have that much time. And uh, ultimately, they just want you to, to do the thing that's going to help to prevent that fracture. So they're just going to hopefully encourage you to take a drug that you want to take, get your buy-in and move you on. The challenge here is that I see a lot of people talking about the 70%, but they don't talk about the 1%. And uh, I think that's just not a complete explanation of what's happening with this drug. So in that conversation about drugs, we also need to talk about risks. Now, every intervention has a risk. I don't care if it's calcium supplementation, drugs, surgery, everything has a risk. So then what risks are accompanied with bisphosphonate drugs? Well, it depends on how you take them. So the oral form, if you take the oral form, there are risks uh, along the lines of side effects, really, of nausea, abdominal pain constipation, diarrhea, esophageal irritation, and even ulcers. And that's why the recommendation exists that if you take the oral drug, you should stay upright for a certain period of time afterward. Now, both the IV and oral forms have symptoms like flu-like symptoms, bone, joint, and muscle pain, low blood calcium, which just makes sense if you're messing with bone metabolism. And then there are the two things that I see pop up in the Facebook groups and online that people talk about a whole lot, and they should. And these are the severe risks of osteonecrosis of the jaw and atypical femur fractures. All right, now I'm gonna talk about atypical femur fractures first and just help explain what that means. So when a femur usually breaks, in the case of osteoporosis, generally we're talking about a hip fracture. We're talking about a fracture at the top part of the femur, right by the hip, it's either the femoral neck, uh, which is where the, the ball kind of comes into the rest of the bone, um, or the, the area called the trochanter or intertrochanteric region, uh, which is a kind of a, a weak spot in that junction between the two. That's a typical femur fracture. An atypical femur fracture is one that occurs just downstream of that in what's called the subtrochanteric region. This region, when it breaks, historically has been from high trauma. So you know, a car accident, motorcycle accident, fall off of a height, something like that, because the bone is extremely strong, usually, in that space. Um, what we're seeing now, because of the bisphosphonates, the drugs will impact negatively bone metabolism. And over time, bones will become more dense, but they'll become more brittle, and then they break in this area because of the stresses in that area. So those are called atypical femur fractures. The challenge with these fractures is that they are harder to fix. They require kind of a different surgery. Um, but then also, when you've been on a bisphosphonate long enough to have this dense, brittle bone, your bones don't heal very well. And so we would have patients where we would fix these things and we would do everything we could to try to get them to heal. And sometimes they just don't heal because the bone metabolism has been so suppressed. These can be a challenge. They can be corrected. Typically we can get them to heal, but sometimes it's a challenge. And then there's osteonecrosis of the jaw. Now, osteonecrosis of the jaw is a terrible complication of a drug. And essentially what it is, is it, it has to do with, obviously, your jaw. You have the two bones, the top and the bottom. And these bones are turning over uh, relatively rapidly compared to other bones in your body. And it's because of the, the impact of the teeth and the stresses from chewing and all this stuff. And so uh, if you are on a bisphosphonate and you are suppressing your bone metabolism, then that turnover is affected and impacted. And anytime you have dental work done, you're actually asking those bones to heal. And sometimes those bones won't heal and you can develop an infection. You can develop what's called osteonecrosis or death of the jaw. Um, and that can be a really terrible thing. It can be almost impossible to get it to heal. Bone grafting doesn't work. Uh, I've seen some terrible pictures. And if you're squeamish, do not Google this because it, it can be really catastrophic. Both osteonecrosis of the jaw and atypical femur fractures are very rare. So when you're looking at the risk in trying to compare it to the benefits, you have to understand that these two very scary things exist, but they are very rare. So you're unlikely to have them, but it's not zero. So some people do actually end up with these things. So then how do we make a decision around these things? Well, there are other considerations to make, which is how long can you actually be on this drug? So the recommendations are to avoid the atypical femur fractures. The recommendations are to stop the drugs either after three to five years, depending on which type you're on, um, and you take what's called a drug holiday. And then people will either be watched over time to see if their bone loss continues, which I think inevitably it generally does, um, or they're put on another drug depending on their scenario. And that's one of the challenges I see with drug therapy for osteoporosis is simply that there isn't a long-term outlook. 
you know, and depending on your position, if you're in your 50s versus 70s versus 90s, the, the long term outlook needs to be considered because a woman in her 50s who we're going to talk about here in a second, but take a, a young woman in her 50s who just went through menopause. She has significant osteoporosis. She meets the criteria to be treated with pharmaceuticals and her doctor recommends a bisphosphonate. OK, so let's say that she's 50 years old in five years, she'll be 55 and she has to come off the bisphosphonate. What now? So I am less interested in your 10 year risk as I am. What's the plan over the next 30 years? And that's why we take a different approach altogether. But what else do we need to consider with the bisphosphonate drugs? Well, we also need to understand that they don't seem to work for everybody. Well, why would that be? Well, it has to do with the fact that the drug is doing a very specific thing. And if you're slowing down bone loss, then you have to have significant bone loss or rapid bone loss for the drug to be effective. So some people that I see when they come in, they don't necessarily have rapid bone loss. They have a bone building problem, right? So this comes back to that. The, if you've listened to me talk about the four R's, recognize why you're losing bone or why you can't build bone is another way to say that, right? And if you're not losing bone rapidly, a bisphosphonate is not going to help you. And we see that in the literature where it doesn't seem to help everybody. And I think that's probably why. And then there's the last part of bisphosphonates in this equation for me, which is we know that we're going to suppress bone turnover globally. We've talked about osteoclast being poisoned and how that will bring down the biomarker of CTX. But what I also see in the labs is that, yes, yeah, CTX comes down, but P1 and P, which is the bone building biomarker, P1 and P is osteoblast function, but that also gets suppressed. And I think this is why atypical femur fractures happen is because we're just suppressing metabolism of bone globally. And I think that over the long term, that is an issue. It will help to reduce fracture risk early on, but what's the long term game plan? And I think that's really important to understand. All right, before we get to the cases that I want to talk about, um, if you could do me a favor, if you are enjoying this content, please click the like and subscribe buttons. The reason why I would love for you to do that is that the more people do that, the more people are going to be recommended this channel in the YouTube algorithm. The more people that are on their search for bone health and osteoporosis solutions are going to find this content. So please help them out by helping me out and click those buttons. If you know anybody that would benefit from this information, please share this with them. If you want to learn more tips and tricks about how you can manage osteoporosis on your own and a little bit about how we do it, look for the link for the free masterclass in the description below. If you want to talk to one of our team members, look for the link up here. This link will take you to a form and get you scheduled to talk to one of our team members about our programs that are available right now. So I'm going to talk about two different types of cases. So these are kind of generalizations, um, but I, I put them together because I want to demonstrate two scenarios that I see very commonly that I think both need to be discussed openly. So we're going to have two different women. They're both going to be in their early 50s, but you're going to see that they're very different. And the reason why I bring this up is that I see a lot on the, the online groups and discussions and comments of people discouraging other people from doing things or telling them that what they're doing is wrong. And I think it's really important to understand that we are all on our own journey and that that your situation may not be the same as this other person in this Facebook group or even your neighbor and that the recommendations for them may not fit you. So let's go through these two cases. So the first one is, let's call it a 52 year old female. She is uh, recently postmenopausal. She got screened because she has a family history of fracture. Okay, so she has a family history of fracture. She got a DEXA and let's say her T-score is negative 2.7 in her hip. So if you put that into FRAX and consider a couple of other things, let's say um, she is a drinker of alcohol and she drinks three uh, drinks a night for the most part. So you put that information in there and her FRAX will come out with over 3% risk of a hip fracture in the next 10 years. So that makes her a candidate for pharmaceutical therapy at the age of 52. So she goes to her doctor and her doctor recommends a bisphosphonate. Um, a lot of primary care doctors um, and internal medicine docs will use an oral bisphosphonate because it's easy. Um, you can take Fosamax and it's simple to do. You just write the script and you're on your way. They also recommend calcium and vitamin D as the guidelines would state and send the patient on her way with a repeat DEXA in one or two years. So that's patient number one. Patient number two, 
Patient number two is, let's say, another 52-year-old female for sake of simplicity. She is uh, postmenopausal, not because she went through menopause naturally, but because she had breast cancer a few years ago. She is on uh, drugs to help suppress estrogen, um, and that has caused her to go through menopause potentially early. Um, and her T-score is similar. And even though if you input her information into the FRAX calculator, her risk does not meet pharmacological management. Um, her doctor has recommended it because she is likely going to rapidly lose bone. And let's even say that they did bone turnover biomarkers and she is rapidly losing bone. Let's say we know that out of the gate. Now, both of these patients may be resistant to drug therapy because the failure of drug therapy can be up to 80% of patients that just don't want to take the drugs because of the risks and because of the, the stigma that goes along with it. So let's talk about each one of these scenarios and how we would manage them in our practice. Okay, so let's go back to patient number one. So patient number one, again, she comes to us, she says, hey, um, I've been diagnosed with this thing. I see you guys do this thing. Talk me through how you would do this. We would say, okay, great. So you're 52, we would get a bunch of information about her lifestyle. So we use our optimization pyramid. So that pyramid starts with the foundational pillars of health. So those would be exercise, sleep, nutrition, and spiritual health. And then we would ask about those things and we would put goals into place. So we would talk about what kind of exercise is good. We have a whole regimen for that. We would talk about nutrition, how to be protein forward, getting it from the right sources, getting nutrients. Are you absorbing those things? Do you need any functional testing? So we would just do all that. And then the next step would be targeted supplements based off of biomarkers and potentially genetics. And then the next step would be a conversation about hormone replacement if she's a candidate and we would talk about all the risks and benefits there. And then the next step would be peptides if she's interested in doing peptides. And there's some interesting peptides in this space uh, for muscle health and being anabolic and overall health in this space. And then uh, the next step would be to have a conversation about drugs. Now, once you go through that whole framework, by the time we get to talking about drugs, we generally don't need them in this case. And the reason why is because all those things that I just said are very likely to improve her fracture risk. And we can take that, that T-score and we can turn it around and we can head it in the right direction. We would test the bone health biomarkers to make sure that they're headed in the right direction. And that fear and concern that she had is immediately alleviated because she has a solid plan. And we know when we're gonna retest. And we know that if we fail, which we, almost never do, but if we fail, then we still have the option to do the drugs. And here's the thing, we've recognized why she's losing bone, the first R and the four R's, and we're gonna retest to make sure we're headed in the right direction. So she's already happier, and we know that she is at risk of fracture, but is she likely to break her hip today or tomorrow in the next six months? Probably not. Now, I can't guarantee that, but probably not. So we have time. Right, So we can take our time, we can do this thing, we can put it in play, and then we can see if we need them. And I can tell you after doing this for hundreds of people that almost never is that the case because there are so many tools at our disposal to help improve bone. Okay, so let's talk about patient number two. So now patient number two comes to us and she says, hey, can you work with me if I have breast cancer or if I'm recovering from breast cancer? And the answer is, of course, because we have so many tools that we can use. So we bring her in and we do that same thing, right? So we talk about the four R's, we talk about the optimization pyramid, we create a program, but here's the big difference. She's on a drug therapy that is going to suppress estrogen and massively, right? So we're not just like low, which is just non-existent and it suppresses everything. So it limits us to some extent, but we can still work on our gut. We can still work on our diet. We can still do all these things, but we know based off of lab testing and DEXA and usually uh, multiple DEXAs, we, we know her trajectory, which is that she is rapidly losing bone. And I'm not confident that we can necessarily stop that with the tools that we have available to us. So this is a scenario where drug therapy, specifically with the bisphosphonate, may actually be a good idea. And this is where we would have a conversation with them and we would bring in their team and we would all talk about it together because it's important to, to take every aspect of it and come up with a plan that is uh, inclusive of all of the different potential options. So for her, we may say, hey, this is a, a not an unreasonable time to actually do an injection of reclast. Let's see if we can get you through the other side of your hormone therapy, and then let's see where you are. 
you know, and maybe we can need to continue to build bone depending on where your starting point is. There are lots of tools we can do, but sometimes medical scenarios, whether it be um, breast cancer treatment, whether it be chronic uh, steroid treatment because of autoimmune disease, there are times where you just have a hard time stopping bone loss naturally. And this is where drug therapy can be really helpful. So what I fear is that when this person goes onto a Facebook group and sees the other person who says that they're you know wildly successful in improving their bone health without drugs, they don't understand the difference between the two cases. And people don't talk about all the all of the medical decision making that goes into their case on Facebook. Why would they? And so it's important that you understand your own scenario and get really good information because I see both sides of this, which is people that are on bisphosphonates unnecessarily, in my opinion, um, and then people that are not taking them when they should because of all of the stigma and conversation around it on the internet. Okay, so lastly, I just want to mention that when doctors are recommending these drugs based off of a calculated fracture risk and you disagree with them, that is okay. We are allowed to disagree with our doctors. But remember that they are recommending these things for a reason and it's not wrong. It is what the recommendations are. It is what the guidelines say to do. So if you're going to deviate away from that, which is fine, I'm all for autonomy and um, being advocates for your own health and having medical independence and decision making. But you have to create a solid plan and work with somebody that can help you to actually do that. And don't just stick your head in the sand. Make sure that you're retesting to make sure that what you're doing is actually working because we know that the drugs will have a specific impact. Um, I talked about all the concerns I have about that, but we know that that impact is there. And Ultimately, everybody just wants to prevent the fracture, the fragility fractures that will so profoundly impact your life. So make sure that you have a plan regardless of which way you're going. All right. So thank you for making it to the end of this video on bisphosphonate drugs. I appreciate your time. If you've enjoyed this content and you found it helpful, please like and subscribe so that more people are exposed to this content. If you want to sign up for notifications, we'll let you know when something new is posted. If you want to learn more about other tips and tricks you can do on your own, look for the link for our masterclass in the description below. And if you want to talk to our team, look for the link up here and you can click on this and it'll take you to a form that you can fill out and you can get scheduled to chat with one of our team members. Lastly, I want to hear from you. I love all the comments, the questions, the community that we're building on YouTube. So please reach out in the description below. There should be a comment section. Leave a comment, ask a question. We'll get to them as quickly as we can. Thanks again for your time.